All right, welcome everyone to week four of our discussion of the Benedict Option, uh, written by Rod Dreher. Um, happy to have you along with us this week. This is, as promised, going to be probably a uh, little bit more of an interesting <laughs> week for us as we uh, get into chapter four, which deals with politics. Um, always a little bit of a hairy thing to discuss, kind of in any context, probably. Um, but, you know, particularly in the church, gets a, a little bit a little bit hairy for us to discuss as well. Um, but as we know and believe, the Bible relates to all of life. And so it certainly right. means that it relates to, um, to our politics as well. And so, um, so expect to hear some of that from us this week. I don't think we're going to get into things like, should we raise taxes or lower taxes <laughs> or, or things like that, that people sometimes will disagree about when it comes to politics, but we are going to deal, deal with some of the weightier matters as it relates to, to culture and the church itself. So um, as we get started again, I'm going to ask for Marty to pray for us. Sure, let's pray. Father in heaven, um, we do come to you acknowledging that you are the one true king, that um, you reign sovereign over your creation, that you have uh, made us for fellowship with you, that for the moment we are sojourners and resident aliens passing through this world and this age, and yet you, Father, reign, and your reign will be gloriously manifested over all in perfect glory uh, one day. But Lord, we pray that you'd use our discussion now that we would, um, that we would consider how we're to walk before you now um, in these days uh, in a way that gives all the glory and honor to you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so our first question. Is it true that conservative Christians have for too long allowed political engagement to distract them from the vital work of building a robust Christian culture? And if so, give examples. Yes. <laughs> and right, so that's the on first to part. The, on to the second question. <laughs> well, I think we've touched on this before, but putting our hope in political parties or um, particular candidates, or more recently, we I think we've said this before in one of these podcasts, um, now the thing is judges. Well, if we can just get the right, uh, if we can get the right candidate, but we get the right candidate because that'll get us the right judges, and, and thinking that that would keep us safe. And um, that's not what's going to preserve our souls. Conservative thinker Yuval Levin argues that Christians would do better off building thriving subcultures than prioritizing seeking political power. Isn't that tantamount to surrender or have the terms of winning and losing changed for believers? So, Marty, if I can, I'm going to ask you to focus maybe on the second part of it, which is the, have the terms of winning and losing changed for believers? What do you think he means by that question? And then uh, what do you think? I'm not sure what he means, but I think that, that we focused too often on winning, <clears throat> trying to win a political battle to the neglect of what really we ought to be pouring more energy into. And um, so I'm going to say, for example, and this is going to come up building communities, but what I would say is, you know, just what, what's the local church body in your local church life? So for me, the local church is my Benedict option. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is the gathering of God's people on the Lord's Day to worship Him. And we gather here morning and evening, you know, at fellowship to do that. Um, we believe we see that pattern in Scripture. Um, the the um, instruction of our children, you know, gathering um, to teach them the faith, which we do in a more systematic way. Wednesday nights, but hopefully families are doing that as well. So when I, I think that that uh, winning, if we have a healthy, robust church life where the word is preached, where we worship the triune God in Christ, where we gather to pray as his people, where we are where we are instructing and making disciples of our own children, the others that the Lord brings. And I'm going back to basic means of grace ministry. I think that we need to be focusing on that. And people, let me say that, that church members need to have a commitment to that and a conviction that those things are important. What we are, and this is broader than just political, but there are probably a lot of American 
Christendom checks a box for about an hour a week. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that box doesn't even require a whole lot of effort to check. And then we're off to basically Vanity Fair, as, as John Bunyan would have said it. So I think that what's happening then is we're not succeeding. We're actually failing at the things that are most important for the glory of God and the good of our souls. But then we're thinking that if candidate X went, won the last election, so he'll appoint the right judges, that we're doing fine, that things are going pretty well, and, and they're not. Yeah, so you know when you look at it, talks about building thriving subcultures and trying to prioritize that over political power in particular. You know, I, I think part of what he's trying to get out here is for so long Christians, and again, we've talked about this a little bit in previous weeks, Christians have focused on um, getting cultural power, whether that comes through things like getting certain people in office that are going to be very favorable to our views, and even hopefully pushing our views and our culture um, from a very top-down perspective, that if we can get the top right, then sort of sort of a trickle-down theory, not to, in economics, but in, in, in uh, so you're, da you're dating yourself when you, mention, when you, <laughs> yeah. when you use that phrase. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, I am 45 now, as, as we oh, uh, talk about. Here we go again. <laughs> what was that, yesterday? <laughs> you... yeah, that was about a week ago. Oh, right? man. Um, Glad you still make it, too. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, yeah. We'll bring you a cane. The walker's yeah. coming soon. Yeah. We'll bring you a cane. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I think that, that sort of, if I can use that term, but it's sort of been a view, sort of a Reaganomics of culture, if you want to think about it that way, that a lot of, uh, a lot of Christians Now you are have, really dating yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that if we can get it right at the top, then, then, um, then it'll permeate out into the culture. But, but that's never really been what's, it's certainly not the biblical view of things. You don't see the New Testament writers, for instance, um, telling everyone, go out and, and, and try to influence the top leaders as much as you can. You don't have much example yeah, of that. A, con a concerted right. effort to reach the Roman Senate right. and, yes. uh, and Caesar. And if we can just get those people on board, right. then everything will go, go great. So you, you get examples of like Paul sometimes getting to speak to some powerful people, but that's not his goal. He's not there because he was trying to get there. He was there largely because he was being persecuted and put on trial. Um, for for doing the right things, and then yeah. he's able to speak to them sometimes. But that's not certainly. I mean, cool. he's, well, so anyway, I, I think what he's what he's trying to say here is when we think about how we gain power, um, the terms of, or I'll get more specifically to the question, the terms of winning and losing. What does that look like for believers? Well, I think I think what he's trying to get here is that the point, or what winning should look like for us, is a transformation of culture through the gospel, through individual relationships, through the uh, the advancement of particular communities. And for us, that's going to be, of course, largely more focused on the church, ironically, than the Eastern Orthodox guy seems to be. Mm -hmm. um, but to, you know, to your point on uh, ordinary grace ministry, but, but that's how a culture is transformed. Um, and for too long, we focused far too much on trying to transform culture from the top instead of the bottom. I well, think that's the overall. And before we move off this, let me throw in something else is, is I don't want to neglect the family. Right. No. But, but nurture of our families ought to be, that's integrated with the church. Sometimes I've even heard people say, well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to prioritize my family. And they, what they mean is they're, prior to, they're, they're saying they can't be involved with the church because of family issues. And what I mean by that is I don't mean that somebody's sick at home. I mean, yeah. they, they want to do other stuff with their family. And the problem with that then is they're not instructing. They're not, they're not really doing all that they could be doing to rear their children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Their children then grow up disconnected from the church. And, and I think what we're seeing now is a, 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 um, I call them youth group grownups, which actually are a lot of people about your age. They grew up in churches they had big youth groups because by then churches were kind of becoming prominent and they mm -hmm. had the resources to have youth ministries and youth pastors. But what these young people learned was that everything was structured around them. Yeah. And, um, and then they get to be 25 and they go, where's the 25 year old church, mm -hmm. you know, or where's the 35 or the 45 year old church, you know, Tim, you're a youngster compared to some of our people. So you're not in the 45 year old church. Yeah. Um, but but then, and, and then another thing with that, whether it's the nurture, you know, the spiritual nurture 
of the body of Christ, the spiritual nurture of our families. One other thing I think that we got to remember is winning, so to speak, is not always as immediately visible in this context. I mean, it may really be that the nurture of our children, you know, we've all, we've all got children. You're really seeing a lot of things at 30 that you can't see at three. And, 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 um, you know, Christ said, my kingdom's not of this world. So, um, some of the things that, that, that are success, you know, some of the things that are winning are things that we don't see in a year or two, all the product. Yeah, see, that. that term winning just doesn't resonate with me because, you know, sometimes winning in this Craig, world. Craig hates competition. You know, Craig <laughs> wants to say that he's an athletic guy, that he plays baseball. He really doesn't even like to keep score. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Now, <laughs> now that I can't play anymore. <laughs> but I think the idea of winning, I mean, in this world is much different than, you know, what did Jesus say? The first shall be last, the last shall be first. So winning as a Christian may be losing. Yeah. In this world. Right. I mean, when we talk about, you know, you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you you look at all how the gospel has gone out through the world. It hasn't been through this world's wins. It's often been through the losses yeah. and through the persecution and through the deaths of the saints. And so I just it just doesn't resonate with me as a, a good way to discuss the point. Well, and I think his, his verbiage there helps us that with that, though. He says, have the terms of winning yeah. and losing change yeah. for believers. And I think that's part of his point, that we need to be thinking of, mm -hmm. of winning not as gaining political power, mm -hmm. but as as uh, you know, tr transformation through the gospel. Um, you know, what I, one thing I thought of when, when you were talking about how long it takes for us to see the effects of the ministry we're trying right. to do, um, back when I was doing R RUF almost 20 years ago now, uh, a common thing that RUF campus ministers would say, and I, I suppose maybe they still say this, I don't know, when people would say, How are, how's it going? How's it going with your ministry? A lot of times the answer we would give back would be, ask me again in 10 years. And, and the, the obvious implication there is it's hard to tell right now. I won't really know how the ministry, how effective right. the ministry has been until I see have these students graduated and you know, started raising godly families and gotten involved in their church life and all that sort of thing. It's sort of like the same question that after you've gotten married, people are asking you, well, how's married life? You know, what is your answer? I mean, well, you know, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna make a commitment. Ask, yeah. me, in, ask me in 10 years. <laughs> That's yeah. Right. yeah, that, that becomes disconcerting yeah. right, if someone yeah. gives that answer. Um, all right, so we will um, jump to the next one here. So this question then gets us into some of the more overtly political stuff. Why is it important for Christian voters to prioritize protecting religious liberty? Okay, so let me, let me frame this one a little bit. Um, part of the reason he's asking this question is he does sort of make the argument in this chapter that we have put a lot, too much of our hope and focus and effort into politics as Christians, as you hear maybe intimated in, in the previous questions there. Um, but he makes the argument that there is an exception to this, and, and there's something that we still ought to be fighting for, right. which is uh, fighting for the protection of religious liberty, that that's vital to our, our culture, um, vital to, to the church and for us as Christians. And so then he asked the question, and why is it important for Christian voters to prioritize religious liberty? Well, I don't know how you prioritize it, because it's part of a, a complete document that is <laughs> the document that governs us as a body, as a, as a country. I mean, you can say you prioritize it, but there's no way to do that in the voting booth. I mean, yeah, we can talk about a First Amendment, but then the rest of them come alongside. I mean, my, my personal opinion is, <clears throat> Once you undermine one amendment, they're all undermined and they're all vulnerable. So I think you, you've you got to look at you know, the whole idea of all of them, the entire Constitution. And that's what I think, you know, conservatives are, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the Rand Pauls of the world, you know, they're constitutionalists. They're focused on the, the, the document and making sure that it's interpreted correctly. So I don't know how you carve out just a priority focus on just one aspect of it, like a religious liberty. 
Um, certainly you can look at candidates who embrace that and you can vote for those, but they, you're also embracing other things. <clears throat> so I think you, you can't ignore some of the other things that are distinctly either Christian or not Christian. So I think that's more difficult than the question leads us to believe. I think it's, it's going to be incredibly difficult to do that as a voter. I just, I see that as a, as problematic. I think Craig makes a good point that, that if we reach a point where in our culture um, the authorities are simply saying, well, you know, we're just going to do what we're going to do. And they're not really trying to look at the laws that we have in our land to protect religious liberty. Then, yeah, I mean, at that point, um, there was a there was a political analyst years ago that said we're really becoming a post-constitutional nation mm-hmm. yeah. that now people are just there aren't. There, you know, people are basically tossing out the rules and, you know, doing, and we're, and he said, we're starting to be ruled by men, not by law. But I, I, another thing I would say, maybe touching on what Craig said, we can still vote for people to support those things. So I think, sure, as, look, religious liberty gives us greater latitude to gather to worship, to do Christian schools, if that's what we're doing, to, um, to homeschool for Christian reasons, to um, to seek to operate according to Scripture, both as a church and as individuals. So we ought to, of course, as much, as long as it's there, that's good. But I think we got to be completely prepared for the reality, um, the possibility that it, that it just may not always be there. Yeah. And you've got Christians right now in areas with no religious liberty mm-hmm. um, that are, you know, whether it be Iran. China, you know, other areas that we could name, they don't have religious liberty. And and that doesn't mean that they're done. You know, that doesn't mean all is over. So I, I appreciate Dreyer, his argument that we that this one is important. It's important. I agree with that as, as far as preserving the latitude we have right now. There may just come a day when we don't have the same latitude. But it seems to be reminiscent of his generation where they're the generation and generations before them of segmentation where, you know, when I went to college and I will, I'm not 45, but you had a year to be undeclared right. to dwell in college to see, well, not anymore. You've got to almost declare in high school what your goals are in college. And so this push to segment everything to me, that's more reminiscent of, you know, cause you can say, I want to vote for candidates that are, you know, are pro religious liberty. But as a believer, there better be some other things on that docket that they're for, or else you can't vote for the just the religious liberty. I mean, you know, for us as a as a family, I mean, life is important. You know, and Scripture I think re- references that. So you can have a candidate out there that's all for religious liberty and all for the First Amendment rights. But then they're not in. They're not for these other things that are equally important. And then you have a dilemma. You can't just segment it out. You've so. Do you not vote for that person, or do you vote for that person despite? Well, it seems to me there are people in the camp that you do vote for that person despite all these other things. I think there's there's huge problems there, and I think what we're experiencing and what we will experience down the road is because of ignoring those other qualities. So I don't think it's as easy as looking at just religious liberty, and we're just going to vote for candidates who are religious liberty advocates because they're also advocates of other things, and you've got to take the whole slate with them. So Yeah, I mean, usually those those things go together. I think the probably the, the pivotal word in this question is prioritize, mm-hmm. and um, you can do that in a couple ways, right? So you can do that just by saying you agree or disagree with something. Um, you can do that by having a track record. Right. Particularly if you're voting for a candidate who's been around for a mm-hmm. while, at least, to, to, of having an actual track record proving that they are going to support and believe in this thing. Um, but then also, you know, when you look at what what they are prioritizing right now, uh, 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 there's a really good practical example of this just within the last few weeks. So we saw, and this went all the way to the Supreme Court, so we saw a church in Nevada that uh, that was suing the state, suing the governor, because the governor put uh, more strict regulations on the church and what they were allowed to do and how many people they were allowed to have in a worship service and all that sort of thing 
than they did on other businesses, including things like casinos. That's right. And liquor stores. Really? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Nevada, Nevada would favor a casino? Right. Shocking. I mean, <laughs> what's up with that? <laughs> Uh, but as opposed so, to a tax exempt organization that they right. couldn't get any money out of, I, I can't believe it. Can you imagine? Something like that. Can you imagine? Um, but it, so it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and then we saw the Supreme Court upheld the Nevada, Nevada governor's decision. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't even come out with a, a majority opinion on it. Was yeah. interesting. They yeah. sort of. Um, so you saw the guy, the guys who gave dissent. Of course, every single one of them wrote an opinion. The the, the minority, uh, the dissenters, but. Um, that was an important case, I think, because it does get back to, number one, what you were talking about, the, we're supposed to be a rule of law, right? And so that's where the, the Christian is supposed to be important. We're not respecters of men, but um, this takes us down a whole other rabbit trail. I'm not going to go down right now, but, but that the rule of law is something that uh, is, is not only a culturally important notion, but a biblical notion for us. Um, but then number two that it, it focuses on a protection of religious liberty. So when we look at the First Amendment itself, it specifically highlights the free exercise of religion as something that, that the government is supposed to protect. Right. And so what we found in Nevada was the, the opposite of that, that the, the, the church was actually held to a harsher standard mm -hmm. than, than just regular businesses were. So that became the big argument there. And, and look, the religious liberty lost in that particular example already. So, so I think prioritizing that, what that would look like in, in our current context would be, okay, who's really highlighting that right. in their own campaigns and making that a linchpin of their... But it uh, speaks to a greater issue. I mean, we talk, I mean, I talked about free speech and, you know, but we also, it's also bringing up the idea of semantics and terms. So what we may perceive as religious liberty Someone else may perceive it as well, but in a very different way. And so then you have the issue of terms. Okay, so we perceive religious liberty as the free right to worship. Well, those on the left may perceive it as a different way. And so then there becomes this issue of language and communication, and that makes the, con the issue even more complex. Well, and, and let me say one other thing, and I mean this to be an encouragement. So I'm pro-religious liberty, and I, I, hope we have as, I hope we have as much of it as we can for as long as we can to protect Christians' ability to openly worship and do the things that we do. But to live in an era of religious liberty, we should keep in mind that this is actually abnormal mm -hmm. historically. Yeah. There was not religious liberty in the Roman Empire. Right. There was not, and, and in fact, we had more religious liberty initially in the first century when we were seen as a sect of Judaism, because Judaism had some religious protections. Right. When Christianity came to be seen as independent of Judaism, it began to take a lot of heat, and, um, and even you know people died for it. You go to the time of the Protestant Reformation, and, and I remember um, when I first studied the Reformation, it just kind of blew my mind that if you lived in a certain part of Germany that was Catholic and you became Protestant, you moved. You know, yeah. that, there wasn't religious liberty. Every, okay, well, everybody, you know, Catholic church over here, Lutheran church over there. It was like if you were in a Lutheran area and you wanted to be Catholic, you got out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you or were, and, and yeah, or, or you didn't survive it. So religious liberty and, of course, why some of our ancestors, country's ancestors mm -hmm. came here, you know, was for religious liberty. But the last few hundred years, the ability to, to have the religious liberty we do is kind of an abnormal thing. And what I mean by I want us to be encouraged is if, that do, if we do see that go away in our lifetime or begin to be curtailed, it will not destroy the church. You know, it, no. it, it, will, it will turn up the heat and we'll have to be more committed and frankly, it'll probably um, it'll probably actually have the effect of pruning out some of the um, I don't mean this in a derisive way, but some of the dead wood, some of the dead branches in the church, because um, it's been culturally advantageous to be a Christian, at least in the southeastern United States in the last century. There have been advantages to that. Right. And probably even where Craig grew up. I mean, I'm guessing that if you were a good Catholic who went to mass, you know, that was sort of culturally. Mm -hmm. It was culturally acceptable. Uh, and, and maybe even respectable, it was you know. Yeah. So, so um, if we see that change, then we'll see who really wants to be there, 
who's really committed mm-hmm. to worship Christ and to follow Christ and to even like openly talk about him when they have an opportunity to, when they know that that's maybe going to draw attention from right. from people. So um, so we ought to be encouraged. It won't. I want religious liberty, and I agree with seeking to preserve that in every way we can. If it starts to take a bad turn, the Lord will use that too. Yeah, good. Well, let me just sum up for Dreyer here up to this point, and this will probably have some effect on the rest of our questions here. I think the argument that he's making here is, if it's true that we've put too much time and and effort and blood and toil into politics in general, um, and we need to draw that back some so that we can focus on other things, I think that's the argument that he's making. Um, is there anything that is worth our time and worth our efforts still in the political realm? And I think the argument he's making here is, yes, at the very least, the protection of religious liberty is something that is, that is worth our time and effort and blood and toil to, to try to protect from the political sphere. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Okay. So um, with that in mind, we'll get to the next one here. Can you imagine ways in which faithful Christians may have to choose between being a good American and being a good Christian? I can imagine ways. Um, You know, I mean, certainly we can look back at history and see plenty of examples of that. If he's asking about the future of this country, and um, I already, I think we already see some of that. I think we already see some of that. There are, there are becoming increasing consequences to being a believer outwardly, especially if you're in politics. I mean, you seem to, there seems to be, you know, the, the um, things have, you know, come off the rails a little bit as far as the niceties and the respect, you know, there seems to be a lot more open um, uh, angst towards Christians. And um, so I said, I think we see some some examples of that right now. I think that those those examples will grow as the years go on, just because of the nature of what we see coming down the road culturally. I mean, I thought of a couple of examples. Um, let me let me just use a hypothetical. Let's say that that one day all healthcare is government owned and run, and yeah. the government says every doctor in their residency program has to participate in performing abortions to learn how to do it. Then I could see where somebody might have to decide, can I pursue this field or not? I think um, we're seeing, so uh, John MacArthur has been in the news Mm -hmm. a good bit. And I think that's a little bit of an example of um, um, good citizen versus faithful Christian. Are we going to gather to worship or not? And, you know, here at Fellowship, we had some weeks that we didn't meet. And and I know even as I say this, there's there's kind of a range of opinions probably within our own body and our own denomination. But but um, to be told long term, um, you just you just need to not worship. Because when you worship, you put people at risk and you need to stop doing that. That, that also has to be looked at in the context of, but God made us to worship. God commands us to worship. Remember what it is that he said to Pharaoh, let my people go, not so they could go have a democratic experiment, which is the modern movies. That's what they make it to be. Let my people go that they might serve me. Let my people go that they might worship me. And um, we believe here at Fellowship that the worship of God's people is central to Christian life. And... Uh, you know, it's it's at the very heart of what we do. So to now, and we all know this, but let me just say it again: we 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 uh, we have an area set up for social distancing. We encourage people not to feel compelled if they don't feel like they can be here safely. So we're not we're not trying to twist anybody's arm. But what I'm saying is, there could come a time when Christians are told, "Well, but if you're really going to be a team player." And um, then you need to do this because this is what the government says you need to do to be a good citizen. That's what was going on in First Peter. The, uh, Christians were seen as bad citizens because they wouldn't participate in it because right. the paganism was all interwoven with the politics. And so there would be these public festivals that that on one hand there was 
idolatry and immorality, but it was part of the, it was like the 4th of July parade, you know? And so if you didn't show up at that parade right. in the town square, then you were considered, um, you were considered aloof and not really a faithful citizen. You know, if you wouldn't pledge allegiance to Caesar, mm-hmm. you were, you were a rebel to be, to be murdered. And so, yeah, there, there certainly are times I think when Christians are going to have to say, um, you know, we might even, some of us might have to say, I love my country and I want to be a good citizen, mm-hmm. but, but there are certain things that I'm called to do by God and I'm going to obey God rather than men if I feel like those two things are coming into conflict. Yeah. Well, Dreyer gives us a, a real life example of this in the chapter. Um, guy who was, I think he was a congressman, was it Kansas or Kentucky? I think it was, it was Kansas, Kansas, but you're talking about Lance Kisner? Yeah. 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 And so, so he's uh, interestingly a member of PCA Church, mm-hmm. and so this is a few years ago now. But uh, he kind of read the tea leaves and saw what was coming down the pipe culturally, and wanted within his own state to do things like protect Christian bakers and florists and and other mm-hmm. groups like that, uh, and protect their religious liberties. So we keep using Baker as an example. Maybe everybody doesn't know what we're referring to there. So. Uh, this is sort of a landmark case a few years ago where there was um, a homosexual couple who uh, came to this Christian baker and said, we want you to bake a cake for our wedding. And the the baker basically makes the argument like, look, I'm, I'm not against selling a cake to anybody because of any particular thing like their orientation or anything like that. But when you're asking me to bake a cake for a gay wedding, a gay marriage, well, that's something that I'm actually religiously against. It's a violation of my faith. And I feel like you're asking me to support something that I find immoral. And therefore, I'm not going to do that. Well, then that, of course, became a a huge issue, kind of blew up, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And so then then this this representative who sees this going on says, well, we need to, at least in my state, need to try to protect people um, and protect their religious liberty in situations like this, so they're they're free to exercise their faith as they see fit. And so he thought, well, we're a pretty conservative group, but this isn't going to be hard to do. Yeah. And what he found was that the culture, even within his own conservative state, had shifted mm-hmm. in a way he had not realized yet. And so he tried to pass this bill to protect the religious liberties of these people, and it failed. And, and even the majority of the conserv- supposed conservatives within his own state said, no, that's, mm-hmm. that's the fell on the side of that's bigotry to, mm-hmm. to defend those people. Uh, and therefore, they should be made to do this. We're not going to protect them from a religious perspective. And so I think that's a big part of what he's talking about here is now increasingly what it might look like to be a good American is to be for those things. And in fact, if you're against those things, you're a bigot and you're a bad American. Right. And so there's a really a, a clear <clears throat> real life example of you got to make a decision between supporting Christ or supporting the broader culture. I think the more the broader culture moves away from Christ, the more the verse about not being unequally yoked comes into play. And referencing Charles Taylor in his book, Sources of Self, where he talks about you know, Christianity was such a part of Western civilization that, you know, even non-Christians and Christians had a lot to agree on. Well, that's not the case anymore. Everybody's out here. And so that verse comes into play. The more the more these issues are secular and anti-Christian, the harder it's going to be for the Christian to yoke himself or herself with those issues. So I think that verse becomes even more prominent as we as the years go by. Okay.